Welcome to Cinema Wellman. I'm your host, David. And if you still have Thanksgiving leftovers in the fridge, well, you made too much food. But feel free to snack away while we recap the best and worst of the film screened here at Cinema Wellman in the month of November. Because of the holiday and the holiday tra- travel, November was a tad light here with only 40 films screened. Even with so few choices, you know, we still have some bombs and a film or two that we'd like to talk about in a positive way, as always. We are pretty consistent here in the cinema. Let's begin at the bottom, as we always do, and since we once again did not screen La Ventura this month, we'll start with The Terminal Man from 1974. I love George Siegel, and it pains me to include this film in the worst of the month since I think he was tremendously talented. He was a good banjo player, <clears throat> excuse me, and has an impressive body of work. The Terminal Man is not part of that body. From our friends at IMDb, hoping to cure his violent seizures, a man agrees to a series of experimental microcomputers inserted into his brain, but inadvertently discovers that violence now triggers a pleasurable response in his brain. Yes. It's as stupid as it sounds. It was written by Michael Crichton, who was fired from writing the screenplay for this movie due to the fact that it didn't follow the novel, the source material, closely enough. He wrote the novel. (laughs) It's amazing. Stanley Kubrick loved this movie for some reason, but he also made Eyes Wide Shut. So, you know, speaking of Kubrick, He's the guest in next week's Director's Corner episode as Cinema Wellman carves out their Mount Rushmore of Kubrick movies. Please join us for that, especially if you like Kubrick. The Terminal Man, back to that, is bad science fiction, and it's bad 70s science fiction, which kind of makes it worse in a lot of ways. George Siegel was much better than this. Even his appearance in the movie 2012 was better than this. Did you see 2012? Next up is a movie that Hollywood legend Joan Crawford said was the worst movie she ever made. Now, I haven't seen all of your films, Joan, but I will agree with you after seeing Trog from 1970. Joan Crawford was a critically acclaimed Oscar-winning actress with over 100 film and television credits to her name over the course of her career. The last film she made was Trog in 1970, and I'm sure she wished she called it quits before this mess. IMDb tells us a sympathetic anthropologist uses drugs and surgery to try to communicate with a primitive troglodyte who is found in a local cave. I think the drugs weren't only used on Trog in this one. This was such a low-budget film that Joan Crawford had to supply her own wardrobe. There was a Stanley Kubrick link to The Terminal Man, and there's a Stanley Kubrick link to Trog. The ratty-ass ape suit worn by Trog was left over from Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. You cannot make this stuff up. Nor... Can you fathom why the worst movie we watched in November was even made? This one was a stunner. From 2020, we give you Money Plane. Now, if, let me preface this. If you really want to see a bad movie, and I'm not saying it's so bad that it's good. It's really bad, and it's, Horrifically bad. And if you feel like that for 82 minutes, you might get a kick out of it. Okay? I'm not saying it's good. All right. First of all, or now it's second of all, I have to thank John Oliver for this one. I had never heard of Money Plane, and it never would have shown up on my radar screen without him mentioning it on his show and describing it as one of the worst things you could ever see. I trust John Oliver implicitly, and after watching Money Plane, that trust has been forever cemented. This was an abomination. Money Plane stars... 
Well, I, I don't even know where to start. Denise Richards is in this. The lead is former WWE star Adam Edge Copeland. Kelsey Grammer, Frazier, <laughs> plays a villain named Darius Grouch III, a.k.a. The Rumble. I am not making this up. Go ahead, IMDb. Have at it. Here it is. A professional thief with a $40 million debt and his family's life on the line must commit one final heist. That's always there. Rob a futuristic airborne casino filled with the world's most dangerous criminals. Do you remember the Lawrence brothers? Andrew, Matthew, and Joey? The Lawrence brothers are all in this. Whoa. And Andrew Lawrence directed it. Double whoa. I'll sum it up with an actual line of dialogue spoken by Kelsey Grammer as he attempts to explain that absolutely anything can be wagered on when it comes to money playing. And I quote, you want to bet on a dude bucking an alligator? Money playing. And yuck. I'm pretty sure DraftKings does not have that wager. As difficult as it may seem to pivot from that, let's take a look at four fine films we screened this month at Cinema Wellman. One is from this year, but the other three were all made way before I was born. Uh, November was oldies month this year. Not quite no new November, but close to it. We'll start current and move backward, starting with a film made by friend of Cinema Wellman, Jennifer Lawrence, and it's no hard feelings. Here's IMDb's description. On the brink of losing her home, Maddie finds an intriguing job listing. Helicopter parents looking for someone to bring their introverted 19-year-old son out of his shell before college. I thought Jennifer Lawrence was tremendous when I first saw her in 2010's Winter's Bone. She's an extremely talented actress who can really do anything. And she's been nominated for four Oscars. She's won one already. And I think there are other Oscar wins in her future. Um, I've seen just about everything she's done, and I've also seen her interviewed on a few talk shows. She's very, she's a very, very funny person, so it's no surprise that she pulled off this raunchy comedy directed by Gene Stupitsky. Lawrence has great comic timing and a very expressive and beautiful face, both of which aid in creating quality comedy. The story is very silly, of course. The young man is played by Andrew Barth Feldman. I had never seen him before, but he is very good in this film. As a 19-year-old who somehow isn't interested in Jennifer Lawrence. That's really one of the funniest bits in the movie. She throws herself at him, but it's just not working. And it's Jennifer Lawrence. Feldman's parents are played by Laura... Benati and Matthew Broderick, and they are a total treat. They try to act all hip and with it, but they're really very awkward. Their initial meeting with Lawrence is especially funny. Matthew Broderick says, we want you to know that we have the utmost respect for sex workers. And she's like, I'm not a sex worker. There's also a very funny bit about Lawrence's age because the parents were looking for someone younger and, and she says that, you know, blah, 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 this is my age. And, I you know, I just had my, my 29th birthday this year. No, two years ago. Um, <laughs> um, I had a feeling Jennifer Lawrence was different in her approach to what she does for a living. And she proves that and more in this movie for doing something that not many actresses or actors would be willing to do. She has a fight scene in this movie in which she fights both women and men on a beach, and she's totally naked, not a stitch, and not a body double, so good for her. It kind of removes the mystery about the body of an A-list starlet on her terms, in my mind. Kind of like, you want to see me naked? Well, then check this out. Uh, I think Jennifer Lawrence has a beautiful body, but seeing it in a fight scene reminded me of an episode of Seinfeld where Jerry's beautiful girlfriend hung out at his apartment naked 
all the time. She was struggling to open pickle jars. She was squatting down and fixing a bicycle. I mean, just not things you want to see someone do nude. Even Jennifer Lawrence. I, I just have so much respect for her. I'm looking forward to seeing all of her movies going forward. Uh, and I read that this is not the first time that she's done a nude fight scene. Um, I tried to forget Red Sparrow. That's why that happened. Um, the last three movies on our best for uh, November list are all made before 1947. Uh, but we, we're not ageist here at Wellman. Again, we watch everything and anything. Let's start with 1931's The Cheat. IMDb tells us a young woman in debt makes an impulsive investment which doesn't go her way. The woman in this pre-Hayes Code movie is played by Tallulah Bankhead. And Tallulah was a tad notorious and scandalous in her day with several stories making the rounds about her sexual escapades. Bankhead once claimed that she was ambisextrous, which is an excellent way to describe what you enjoy. Well done, Tallulah. This 1931 movie was actually a remake of a 1915 movie made by Cecil B. DeMille. So, remakes are <laughs> nothing new in the world of cinema. Bankhead's character, Elsa, has a lot of vices, and one of them is gambling. And she racks up $10,000 in debt, which would be $200,000 today. Elsa even embezzles from a charity she works for. Bad choices there, Elsa. Next on our list is from 1938, and it's Four's a Crowd. Again, IMDb. Robert will do anything to get the big account that has eluded him. His public relations business makes public angels of rich scoundrels. Jean needs someone to save the paper, and she wants Robert. Now, the only reason that this film caught my eye is because it was directed by Michael Curtis. And Michael Curtis just happens to be the most watched director here at Cinema Wellman, and Four's a Crowd is the 46th film we've screened here that was directed by Michael Curtis. And this is essentially a rom-com, and I still liked it. Michael Curtis could do it all, and I know that I could trust him with any genre, and I obviously do. Errol Flynn is excellent in this screwball comedy, proving that he wasn't only good at playing pirates, and other guys with swords. The writing is crisp, snappy, and snarky, which typifies movies of this type during this time period. The misadventures of the quartet are quite amusing. The butler is fantastic and reminded me of John Gilgood in Arthur. So snarky. While researching this movie, I came across some of the PR for it, and it was amazing how they promoted movies back in the day, especially in print, which you really don't see much of anymore, unfortunately. It was great stuff, filled with quotes. Uh, that leaves us with only one oldie left, and it is the best best of November here at Cinema Wellman, and it was a doozy. From 1946, it's Decoy, IMDb. A mortally wounded female gangster, lady gangster, recounts how she and her gang revived an executed killer from the gas chamber to try to find out where he buried a fortune in cash. This is a true B movie, and it's proof that they can be as good as the features that they preceded back in the day. That premise is bananas. And the lead is played by Jean Gilly, and she is billed on screen as Miss Jean Gilly, and she's given an introducing credit, and she's ruthless and vicious. Gilly only made two Hollywood movies, and they were pretty much filmed simultaneously in 1946. I really enjoyed her in this, but she didn't have much of a career at all. This is one of those cases where a person receiving the introducing credit was given that distinction due to whom they were attached to at the time. This was pretty common, I think. Gilly made this movie with director Jack Bernard. Bernard also happened to be her husband when Decoy was made. I think she would have had a career as a femme fatale in film noir movies, but she left us quite early at the age of 33 after only 20 films. Gilly received the introducing credit for this film, even though 
It was the 19th of her 20th of her 20 career films. You never know with that credit, which is one of the reasons why it fascinates me. Well, that is a wrap from here at Cinema Wellman for our best and worst of November. It's November already. Um, the message today, I guess, is if you're a movie fan, you owe it to yourself to seek out and watch old movies. There is so much out there that's worth seeing. Don't think that cinema was invented the year you were born. And don't think that your generation invented sex or drugs, or rock and roll for that matter. <laughs> Those black and white movies, they're phenomenal. As Donnie once said, there's never been a good movie made in color. <laughs> Hope you join us next week when we continue our Director's Corner series with a focus on Stanley Kubrick. Each director is different, so we're trying to make each Director's Corner episode a little different. So for Kubrick, we will be presenting our Mount Rushmore of movies. And that means a lot of his popular slash critically acclaimed movies are just not going to make this list. So join us to see who makes the cinematic granite. Um, I got to ask your help. If you're watching this, um, our Cinema Wellman wish list episode is coming up on December 22nd. And what I'm looking for are any suggestions about um, what you wish for as far as cinema is concerned. Uh, either what you wish for, things that you wish movies did more of, or things that you wish cinema would just stop. Okay? Send us an email at cinemawellman uh, at gmail.com. Um, we hope to hear from you, and we'll add you to the uh, list of letters that I'll be reading on December 22nd, so you still have some time. Um, and that's it. I hope you join us next week for... Kubrick's Mount Rushmore. And until then, take care.